Well, welcome. This is being live streamed, so this is a new thing for Whitworth Forensics to be able to have this event and have it live streamed so people watching at home and from their offices, so that's great. My name is Mike Ingram. I have the privilege of being the Director of Forensics at Whitworth University, and for the first time in three years, we get to debate in person with our new friends from the Republic of Ireland. We have done this since 2012. It was interrupted because of that disease, and it has just been wonderful to be able to resume this. So the Irish Times newspaper, somewhat analogous to the New York Times in our country, has sponsored a debating championship for more than 50 years. The Times sponsored preliminary debates in multiple cities with over 150 teams competing. They have a great competition. The top two teams are the top team of two persons, and the top individual speaker win a trip to tour the United States. Tonight's debate is also sponsored by Pax Rhetorica, a nonprofit organization located in Helena, Montana, committed to international dialogue and discussion. Tonight's also sponsored by speakers and artists and our own forensics team, the Arguing Bucks. And look, it's Isaac time. <laughs> so tonight, let me introduce our guest from Ireland, Alva Noonan and Gavin Dow. They will speak first and second, respectively, are from Black Hall Place the Law Society of Ireland, and they won the team competition. They're equivalent to being law school students in the United States. And on the end, Oliver McKenna is a first year student from Munster Technological University in Cork. He's studying to be a mechanical engineer. Welcome. And in the final round of that tournament, they have the privilege to debate this house believes it is time to directly and democratically elect the president of the European Union. So that's a fun topic that would be interesting to hear. So a few things about them. Uh, Alva said she began debating in school about age 14 because she hated public speaking. I truly couldn't think of anything worse. If I had to speak in front of more than two people, my face would turn purple. Well, it looks like you've come a long way since then, I think. And uh, she says, like Gavin, when she went to college for undergraduate, her focus was elsewhere. She did not debate in college, but she has been debating for the Law Society. She took the chance to enter the Irish Times competition. She liked the fun and approachable style. She says, it's one, two, skip a few, and here we are. <laughs> so that's not really well. So we're so glad that you're here. She is contemplating a career in business law or some other things in the future. Uh, Gavin says he did some debating in high school but lost interest. I preferred going, on, going out on nights out. Uh, but then he said in his final year at college, he attended the Irish Times Championship to watch his friends and was impressed with the caliber of speakers and enjoyed the focus on playing to the crowd. Perhaps we'll see some of that this evening. So he, as a fellow law student, was offered the chance to enter. He jumped at it. He wants to be a solicitor, but he worked in radio part-time and might return to that in a part-time capacity as well. And then Oliver's story is, in all the years that I've done this, Oliver, no one's expressed this quite like you. He admits that one of his motivations for joining debate as a teenager, his older brother advised him that he regretted not debating in high school and suggested Oliver join the debating club. I don't know, ma'am. The guys who do it are way more confident talking to girls. <laughs> so Oliver took up debating. He had a successful debating career at the Christian Brothers College Court. He was named best individual at two regional competitions and represented Ireland at the prestigious events at Oxford and Cambridge. He was the unanimous choice of the judges for the best individual at the Irish Times Championship. And he remembers arriving at Munster Technological and wishing he could continue debating. So he formed a debating society and entered the Irish Times and won, and here he is. So great stories to bring you to Spokane tonight. We're so looking forward to the exchange with you. And now for the home team, three seniors who have competed for the Arguing Bucks for four seasons. Uh, literally tomorrow morning, we are driving to Boise to compete in our national tournament. So I'm so grateful that they are prepared and debating tonight and representing us well. Aidan Hollister is a senior chemistry major from both Bellingham and Coeur d'Alene, preparing for a career in medicine. Sky Gordon is a senior political science major and a pre-law student. 
right here from Spokane, and Drew Longs is a senior political science major, I think on the pre-law pre track as well, from Kalispell, Montana. So here's what will happen tonight. Whitworth will debate the resolution, nuclear power is the most important solution to climate change. So each debater will give a seven minute speech. I will clap after the first minute, and then in that five minutes, they are interruptible. That is, they may take points of information or questions from the other side. I will clap in the last minute, and then after seven minutes, I will clap repeatedly, and you get the hint, knock them off, you know who you are. Okay? So again, we're so grateful that you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, I call this house to order. Mr. Prime Minister, will you make your speech? <laughs> Not to exceed seven minutes. <laughs> problems which didn't really exist or weren't very noticeable back in the past. One of these is this issue of climate change, this bugbear that we hear all the time on the news, and what's going to happen? Our Earth is heating up to the point that eventually it'll be more difficult to live here. And that's why, because of this modern problem requiring a modern solution, we look at this particular topic, that nuclear power is the most important solution to climate change. Today we're going to discuss three simple issues, three reasons why nuclear power is indeed this most important issue. We're going to talk about safety of nuclear power, because nuclear power is the safest form of energy and generation that exists. We're going to talk about cost effectiveness, how nuclear energy is also the most cost effective form of energy that isn't destroying the environment as we speak. And finally, we're going to talk about this idea of energy efficiency, how nuclear power is the most energy efficient form of power generation that exists. So first, Let's talk about safety. And there's a couple of different metrics we can use to discuss safety. The first and most useful is deaths per terawatt hour. Essentially, there's a risk associated with doing anything, whether you're on a windmill climbing up to repair it in some way, or you're just trying to run a gas-powered plant or a coal-powered plant, there's always some risk. But what is the riskiest way? Well, Madam Amitha Jagamorhan reports on January 29th of 2021 that um, over the course of human history, and including these past few years, if you look at the metrics of deaths per terawatt hour of power generated, nuclear energy is the safest form of power generation on Earth, even including the horrific Chernobyl disaster. So we find that when we're comparing nuclear energy to any other form of energy generation, it's way safer to use nuclear energy. Point but, of permission. Sure. Would you rather live in Chernobyl or an old wind farm? Well, considering that Chernobyl was actually a graphite reactor, and that was because of the Soviet Union not really knowing what they were doing, and because of that, it all went to heck in a handbasket, we actually find that nowadays, those sorts of disasters are physically impossible from a thermodynamics perspective. So let's now discuss this issue which actually does exist, and is actually a figment of reality, and that's of how do we deal with nuclear waste. Well, actually, according to CNBC on June of 2022nd, the energy and nuclear waste could power the United States for 100 years. Now, why aren't we hearing more about this? How will come every time we talk about nuclear energy, people bring up waste as a severe issue? Well, the issue is, is that there was actually an executive order in 1977 by President Jimmy Carter. There was, unfortunately, way too many terrible executive orders in America's history for this to be the worst executive order in America's history. <laughs> but when with respect to energy density and, energy, and our energy policy and climate policy, this is undeniably the worst executive order in America's history. Because what this executive order said is that we in the United States are not allowed to recycle nuclear waste and use that in reactors anymore. So what's the United States' official position? We stick it in a pool of water and hope it goes away in a thousand years. That's the genius of the United States energy system. And unfortunately, because of this executive order, we're not able to realize the solutions to nuclear waste. But according to the textbook, Modern Nuclear Chemistry, written by professors Walter D. Loveland, David G. Morrissey, and Glenn T. Seaborg, who you might recognize that last name as Seaborgian, he discovered an element which is pretty neat. He discovered this idea of, the, they talk about the Purex process, which is how France and Japan and many other countries go about recycling their nuclear waste. What they find is that your nuclear fuel rod isn't fully used up in, a chemical rea in the nuclear reaction. And so you can recycle that, and up to 90% of that spent fuel, as uh, the previous source talked about, to actually be used 
to forward in an additional nuclear reaction. Now, not only is our current system right now very capable of dealing with this waste issue, but let's talk about future improvements, namely intrinsic safety. As obviously hearing about Fukushima, which happened in 2013, is a bit of a concern. But thankfully, the Environmental Progress magazine known as Columbia Insight reported a couple of, last August that small modular thorium powered reactors actually use waste as an energy source and they incorporate walk away safety measures. What does that mean? Well, by the properties that will be discussed by my friends a little bit later, we actually find that these are impossible from, by the laws of physics and thermodynamics to actually melt down. So meltdowns are a figment of the past, not of the future. Let's now talk about this idea of cost effectiveness. How much money will we actually end up spending on nuclear power? As if it was severely more expensive than hydro or wind, we actually find that maybe it's not worth the investment. Well, according to the Brattle Group, they discuss this idea of the levelized cost of nuclear energy. And they say, quote, these findings determine that the retention of existing nuclear power plants, even at a modest premium, represents a cost-effective method to avoid CO2 emissions and enable compliance with any future climate policy at a reasonable cost. Sustaining nuclear viability in the interim will reduce long-term emissions and is the reasonable and cost-effective insurance policy in the long term. It's a bit complicated. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that nuclear energy, though it is often maligned by people who are anti-media, like oil companies and uh, hydro plants, particularly, who are weirdly in an alliance of a green energy source and a not very green energy source, and that nuclear is bad. Why? Well, because it would put them entirely out of the business. But the actual experts are clear. When we are looking at nuclear energy, it is extremely cost-effective to address climate change. Let's now talk about this third issue, energy efficiency. Now here we have to get a little bit more technical and a little bit more sophisticated here. We're talking about their capacity factor of nuclear energy. The capacity factor is essentially this idea that any mechanism, a reaction or a windmill spinning, generates some sort of electricity. And how often can that actually work at maximum capacity? Well, as a matter of fact, according to the Yale School of the Environment, this actually nuclear energy is able to operate its full power 92.3% of the year, as opposed to hydro with 38.2%, wind with 34.5%, and solar with only 25.1%. So nuclear energy is far and away more efficient and, and more capable of producing energy than these other alternatives. Furthermore, according to the US Department of Energy, wrote on March 31st of 2021, despite producing massive amounts of carbon free power, nuclear energy produces more electricity on less land than any other clean air source. So in terms of any sort of clean effective, any sort of clean program to address climate change, we see clearly nuclear energy is the best. As such, nuclear energy is the most important factor for climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having us here. A special thanks for letting us compete against your strongest team, and to Mike and his team for showing us a great time so far. Um, I believe Aidan was referred to as Mr. Prime Minister, so I would like to take Madam President as my title for the evening. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. Um, also would like to note that we all extremely regret treating those information forms as our personal diaries when we were asked to give some information about ourselves a few weeks ago. I know personally it was like late in bed, just like throwing down some thoughts, not expecting them to ever be read out in front of anyone, so that was a nice surprise. Our argument here tonight is very simple, it's not nearly as technical, and it's two-tiered. Firstly, I'm going to show you all the true most important thing to you know, sustainably manage climate change. And then you're going to realize that that's too easy for us to win with. So I'm going to give you a second <laughs> alternative to their proposal. <laughs> the most pervasive and aggressive threat to the climate and our societies. We all know the answer to this question. We might not like the answer to this question, but it's us. We are the problem. We are the deadliest thing, and we are what's ruining our climate. We are overpopulating, polluting, deforesting, 
We are the ones burning all these fuels. We are the only reason that these fuels are even needed. Let's take a look at what Team Ireland has done over the last two weeks. 14 days, 15 flights. I have not walked more than 20 meters, except to go from car to car, from canteen to debate. We are being driven absolutely everywhere. And I don't know the last time I ate something that didn't come out of a collection of plastic containers from different places. Like it or not, we are the problem here. We are the need for this fuel. We are the need for this renewable resource. The ultimate solution, like it or not, is us not being here. But that's too easy of a way to win this debate. We remove humans from this, the climate heals itself, and there's no further issue. That's me done in two minutes. There's no debate for us to have here. But that's too easy. So we're going to go level up, because that's a boring debate for everyone. <laughs> So far, we have heard of nuclear energy being offered as the solution. So let's look at nuclear energy in stages, three different cycles. Firstly, getting started. We've heard it framed as the most cost-efficient way. It is about 10 billion to build one reactor, just one. How accessible and efficient. I'm sure people all over the world have 10 billion handy for just one reactor, let alone all the reactors they actually need. Next, we have the process stage, which we like to think of as accident time. <laughs> we've heard that these are all figments of our imaginations and things of the past. And yes, we've all heard of Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and there's a reason I don't need to tell you all what happened there. Because we know of how like, entirely jarring and catastrophic those incidents were. And we've been told by Aiden that those things are impossible now and a thing of the past, and don't worry about that. Here's a lot of technical stuff and bits from science papers that I've read, and it's all fine, <laughs> I promise you. But that is simply untrue. Literally last week, Minnesota, not too far from here, on the right continent at the very least, you know, finally revealed that they very recently had their own nuclear leaks. Like, this is not some figment of our imagination thing of the past that you shouldn't be worried about. This is a very active issue. If we get past that, you know, even getting the reactors up, not accidentally, you know, killing and maiming people in the meantime, then we get to the potential waste, which we have already heard being raised. Where does this waste go? Currently, very simply, it's all gathered up, put in trucks, and they go to our beautiful mountains, which we spent the morning in over at, what is it? Pitcher and Bowl, we were there this morning. So imagine those beautiful mountains. Now blow a hole in the middle of them, and just fill it with nuclear waste, because that's the current solution. It's lovely to hear about all these different ideas of scientific journals, that if we did this, it'd be lovely, and if we did that, it'd be great. We're talking about now, we're talking about the reality, and what is happening is mountains are being driven to, they're being exploded inside, and they're being filled with nuclear waste for somebody else to deal with someday. That is the process we're being told about. So, yes, we all silently look to nuclear, nuclear reactions, is that what we're convinced? We've all heard of the idea of betting on red, going to Vegas, picking blindly, and putting all your cards on one thing. That is what the proposition they're trying to get you to do tonight. They are trying to get you all to bet on red, the red button of nuclear energy. We are going for a far less risky and far safer and more future-focused solution. Gavin and Oliver will enlighten you on our plan for the future, but I promise you this much. It is more democratic, it is more equitable, and it's one where we might all survive. It responds to the issue of time that arises with climate change. This is not some, in a hundred years' time, it'd be great if we could work out all these kinks and then nuclear might work. We don't have a hundred years. That is the way the climate is escalating at the moment. So the solution we're going to offer you tonight will deal with all of that in a right now. It'll deal with the immediate issues. Don't bet on red, bet on the future with us. Summarize what we've gone through so far. There are two tiers to this. The first one, plain and simple, we all here are the problem this evening. Getting rid of us is actually the most important, effective solution. Completely understand why we might not like that as a solution. I personally quite enjoy being here. <laughs> really enjoyed my holiday, but um, solution number one is human. Like it or not, we are what's causing the problem. We are the reason why energy is needed. We are the ultimate solution. But understandably, we might not all buy into that. So instead, we're going to recognize that nuclear energy is not some all solving panacea. It is costly, it leads to catastrophic incidents, it is accident prone at the very least and it only damages the climate further by destroying our existing natural resources and filling them with this glowing green, I think it is like a mountain dew colored sludge. Don't risk it all, 
Don't bet it all on red. Choose the opposition and choose protecting the climate going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. And a member of the government, I'm Secretary of Defense. <laughs> fantastic speeches from our opponents today and I'd like for you to lower your expectations now uh, because unfortunately I do not have an Irish accent and uh, don't worry they're going to have another speech in just a minute um, but let's start by responding to some of the points that our opponents have brought up about the idea of nuclear energy how do we measure what makes something the most important my opponents first respond by saying well if we're going to look at it simply, the real problem is humans. And even though this isn't necessarily their most serious argument, I think it's important to address. Let's look towards the fact that humans don't have to be the problem. Right now, yes, we are the problem. We are taking 15 flights, and that power is coming from coal. We are doing things that are detrimentally affecting the environment. But we don't have to be if we turn towards nuclear energy look towards all the points that my teammate brought up in their first speech. Now, let's get into some more serious... Mission. Sure. How long do you think planes will be powered by nuclear energy? Sure, I think that planes will be powered by nuclear... Er, sorry. Right now we have submarines powered by nuclear energy. But we don't have planes powered by nuclear energy. That's fine. We don't need every single aspect of energy consumption to be powered by nuclear energy. If we move from right now using 10% of the global energy for coming from nuclear and move towards 40, 50, 80%, that's what makes nuclear the most important contribution towards solving climate change. We don't need to fix every problem. We're just saying it's the most important solution. So now let's look towards some of the points that my opponent brought up. They talk about this idea of the accidents that we've seen, which yes, are horrific. But let's get into the reason why we see these things are not going to happen in the future. Under the laws of physics, they're not. My opponent brings up this uh, example in Minnesota that I've also heard about. But this has to do with incorrect disposal of wastewater and this being kept from the public. So yes, there is wastewater with radiation in it that was incorrectly disposed in Minnesota. But that is not the same thing as a nuclear meltdown. Those are two very different things. And nuclear meltdowns, like what we saw in Chernobyl, in Fukushima, those are impossible today, and here's why. We see that right now, the modern American reactors and reactors around the world uh, use light and heavy water to moderate those reactors. And because of the liquid salt in those reactors, when they get too hot because of a meltdown, the reactor automatically shuts off. It is impossible for it to continue functioning and producing any kind of energy using those fuel rods once the heat exceeds a certain temperature. So we see that these meltdowns just aren't something that happens with modern day reactors. So now let's look towards some other points that my opponent brought up. My opponent mentions these ideas about how uh, it's impossible now. We can't look towards things that might happen in the future when they're not necessarily feasible. It takes $10 billion to build one reactor. This sounds like a great point, but let's look towards the fact that, again, this is our most cost-effective option. When we look towards things, other options that we might take to keep us from dying out, like wind or solar, not only are they going to use up huge swaths of land, they're going to take up time, they're only operating at 20 to 30% capacity to produce the same amount of energy that nuclear can produce when it operates 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours a day. This is something that can't be replicated by other forms of energy because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and there just isn't enough land on Earth for us to have reliable energy coming from these other sustainable sources. And so what we look towards is, yes, this might not be a solve-all. This isn't going to end climate change tomorrow. It's not going to take all of the carbon out of the atmosphere. 
But when we look towards the resolution that we're debating, that resolution is what is the most important solution to climate change. And that is nuclear energy. We see more advancements in the field that are awe-inspiring when we look, we look towards the future. We see things like the use of thorium, which is four times more prevalent in uh, underground than uh, uranium is. It's safer. It doesn't allow for uh, nuclear proliferation because you can't use thorium to make a nuclear weapon. And we also see that it produces up to 10 times more energy per nuclear reaction when we use a thorium reactor instead of a uranium one. Sure. You're talking about something that doesn't exist yet. That just isn't part of reality right now. We need a solution right now for climate change. We don't have forever to solve this. Sure, I can understand where you're coming from, but thorium exists right now. Countries like China and India have already built and are already using thorium reactors. The United States is falling behind, but these reactors exist right now. Thorium is an element that exists right now, and it is accessible for us. And sure, we can look towards the fact that it takes $10 billion to build one reactor. But look towards our military budget. Look towards how much the United States and other countries funnel hundreds of billions, even trillions of dollars on other projects when we know that this is the absolute most consequential. This is the end all, be all. We have to make a change, and that change can't come from other sources. We've seen that it's simply not feasible, it's not possible to use other renewable sources like wind, like solar, like hydro. It's not possible for us to use them to the extent that we need to shift away from the 80% of our energy that currently comes from fossil fuels. And so if we look towards what is not the, just the most safe in terms of deaths per terawatt hour, not just the most cost effective, not just the most energy efficient, but also what is our only option when we're looking to solve for climate change. Our only option is to start using nuclear energy, to invest in it as much as we can. And I'm not saying that it will necessarily stop climate change, but I am saying that if we're going to have any chance, if we're going to have any kind of hope to turn things around from this point, we have to look towards investing in nuclear, investing specifically in thorium or in fusion, in these future technologies at every turn, because this is the only way that we are going to be able to make a real difference when it comes to climate change. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening mom and dad, and good evening America. I've always wanted to say that line in front of an audience, practice that in my bedroom in front of the mirror every week. Um, harmful to human health, should not be consumed by children, potentially explosive after effects. All these things can be said about the food in the cafeteria in Whitworth College. <laughs> but enough about toxic waste, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about nuclear energy. <laughs> Climate change is already going to end the world eventually if we don't fight it. And tonight, the proposition has kindly given us a way to end that world even quicker. <laughs> Climate change is slowly suffocating the planet with, our, with its high temperatures, leading to crises and mass migration in the poorest parts of the world, sinking cities that are below sea level. But a nuclear explosion or nuclear waste threatens the entirety of humanity and will lead to the end of the world potentially quicker than climate change will bring us there. As my teammate, no thank you, as my teammate Alva has said, putting all, uh, the proposition are putting all their chips on red and that red being the red button. But my first point that I'd like to, to make is that as climate change is a global problem, we need a global response. And this is something that has not been acknowledged so far by the proposition, that we can't have a proper global response to climate change just using nuclear power. Why? Because nuclear power is too expensive. Renewables, the alternative, democratizes energy and allows poorer countries to fight climate change as well as wealthier countries. Which are the countries that have nuclear energy at the moment? 
Russia, France, China, the UK, Japan. These are all rich countries. These are all countries that can afford to place billions of dollars or euros or yen into making nuclear reactor, uh, reactors. I don't see Mali, I don't see Liberia, I don't see Haiti, I don't see uh, countries in the world which are most affected by climate change having any nuclear energy. Some countries have money, but every country has natural resources. And when you have natural resources, you can use renewable energies to generate energy for your country. The sun shines in, the wind blows in Alaska, the sun shines in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the sun even shines in Iowa, believe it or not. <laughs> the waves smash through the Indian Ocean. Nuclear power creates a world of immense en energy inequality because the richest countries in the world are the ones with the energy power. They're the ones who can afford to, um, to invest in this technology and power their uh, factories, power their cars using nuclear energy. The poor countries, the ones which are most affected by climate change, are left behind because they're not able to invest in nuclear energy. They're forced to uh, rely and basically be taken, uh, taken hostage by richer countries and forced to buy their energy, the nuclear power, from richer countries. That is not a better world. That is a less equal world. And effectively what the proposition are giving us by saying the most important solution to climate change is nuclear power is that they're saying that we should be living in a two-tier world, a world of great energy inequality where the rich countries can use nuclear power to advance their societies and the poor countries are forced to either rely on the rich countries or, um, are, uh, or are left with no energy at all. We propose that a much better solution is that the world's resources are invested in renewable energies, which are open to every country in the world. To that point, sir. Yes. If we're going to invest money in more expensive forms of energy generation, how does that help poor countries who can't afford to spend money on hydro and wind dams for more expensive? Uh, they're not necessarily more expensive. Solar panels are, can be erected relatively cheaply. They don't need $10 billion. They don't need this underlying knowledge or expertise in the area of energy generation and nuclear energy generation. Uh, solar panels are widespread around the world and uh, they can be relatively uh, cheaply installed in poorest, poorer parts of the world. Um, uh, this is a, another point that I've, Alba has mentioned that I'd like to, to go back to. That really the most important solution to climate change is not nuclear energy, it is every single person in this room. It is human consumption, reducing human consumption because Energy, ladies and gentlemen, is only created in response to our consumption, to our demands, to the things we want and need. Any fans of Shrek here? <laughs> Come on. Hey, <laughs> that few people have taste in this room? I thought better of you. Recently, I bought a sticker online which said, Shrek is love, Shrek is life, and had a picture of Shrek uh, on it. Is it a want? Is it a need? I don't know. I spent five euros on it. <laughs> that sticker was shipped from China. There had to be energy and emissions going into the people getting to the factory to make that sticker, designing the sticker. The actual factory itself emitted to produce that sticker, and um, that had to be shipped from China to Dubai, Dubai to Ireland. Think of the amount of emissions created for the sake of having Shrek's face on a little sticker. It's a great sticker, and I'm sure you'd all love it in your Christmas stockings this year. But, essentially, uh, I am the problem, and we are all the problem. The greatest contribution I could have made to stopping climate change, as Alba has said, was not coming on this trip, and I'm delighted to be here, but it's the greatest contribution I could have made. In fact, um, the uh, best thing you could have done um, is probably not come to this debate. Uh, because there is a lot of hot air coming out of my mouth <laughs> right now, as you can probably appreciate. The less we consume, ladies and gentlemen, the less energy we need. Therefore, the debate is not about how, where we get our energy from. It's about um, whether we need much energy at all. The less energy we need, the less we pollute. So the solution to climate change is in all of our hands. It's that we all consume less. It is so simple, yet so difficult at the same time. The most important thing that we can do is to start consuming less. And the proposition, with their technical arguments, which I appreciate are thoroughly researched, unfortunately are not meeting that burden of proof and not addressing that. And um, just to respond to what has been said so far by Aiden and Sky, uh, new technologies are developed in the area of nuclear. But the, the newer the technologies and the more novel they are, the greater the risks, we argue, for there to be um, 
greater nuclear waste, uh, potentially explosions, and potentially harmful consequences as a result of nuclear power. Uh, I'll leave it to Oliver to uh, wrap up the debate for us later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Member of Opposition. Mr. Member of Government, the Attorney General. Uh, actually, in your guys' honor, I started by taking notes on your case in green. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and ran out, so um, it's only a half tribute. Uh, but uh, this reminds me of something that was mentioned early on in one of the first speeches, is that um, we can change our titles, and that's something that I would like to participate in as well. Um, I would accept Grandmaster, <laughs> um, the boss. <laughs> Sir, if you say it authoritatively enough. Uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, something my, the opponent said in, our la in their last speech was that uh, Sodexo is synonymous with nuclear power because they're both toxic, and I will grant them Sodexo may be quite toxic. But it does not power millions of homes. It can't even power your own body. <laughs> and so I think it's not an apt comparison in this particular case. But I think one of the major things that we need to look at is our opponents provide you with two potential solutions that they say would be more feasible to really like usurp fossil fuels than nuclear power would be. Um, and they say, first of all, like let's call all of the human population. Uh, or essentially, that's what it boils down to. Uh, and I understand this argument, that's true. Like if we were all gone immediately, that would be really, really great for the planet. <laughs> However, how are you going to accomplish that? <laughs> I'd imagine that whatever means you have to accomplish a mass extinction event of the entire human species, uh, that's probably not going to be powered by green energy. <laughs> I have my suspicions, but uh, maybe Oliver will tell you otherwise. Uh, our, our opponents also mentioned that it's super costly, that it'll cost $8 billion, and then I think my the teammate actually raised that and said it was 10 billion. Uh, who knows, it's probably somewhere in that range. Uh, but what I would argue is that despite this initial startup cost to make a nuclear reactor, what we see is that after two years, it's massively, massively more efficient when it comes to cost. Because it is the most cost effective per kilowatt hour. It runs on its highest capacity for the longest amount of time compared to all other renewables. Like my teammate said, you're not going to have sun all day. You're not going to have wind all day. And dams need to be updated, replaced, maintained all the time. Uh, in fact, the, li the lifespan, actually, of uh, wind power, I mean, a turbine lasts 20 years. A solar power panel lasts about 50 years. That's not sustainable. A nuclear power plant lasts upwards of 110 years. Or at least that's their prediction. Most of them haven't reached that age yet. Uh, but our, our information? Yeah. It obvious that there are reasons that long? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's because we haven't had 110 years yet happen. <laughs> like, it was, it was maybe like 1950, for example. Uh, and that's why we have not reached it. <laughs> they could. Um, so, uh, another point that we've been talking about a lot is this issue of waste. And you know, I have a few responses to that. Uh, as, we, as we've been mentioning, waste can be reused if we just get rid of this ridiculous executive order that exists in the status quo. <laughs> Um, but also, uh, our opponents want to make waste look like this huge, scary thing that's going to blow holes in mountains and make you start like glowing and make you <laughs> grow new legs and arms. Uh, not the case, actually. <laughs> it seems scary, but it's not. That's only because the waste of nuclear is physical. We can see it. We can touch it. The waste of natural gas, the waste of coal, the waste of making batteries for solar panels, those are all gas emissions. So we don't see it, so it's less tangible for us. It's not something that's... Like, ooh, it's trapped inside that little building there. It's probably really scary. It's actually the re least radioactive, if you heard what Aiden said in his first speech. In terms of radioactivity and the impact that it actually has on human health, it's the lowest by far, by far. And it doesn't seem intuitive when you first think about that. But when you think about the problem of recycling solar panels that are only lasting 50 years, uh, recycling the massive amount of metal and actually toxic material that it takes to build windmills after only 20 years of use, 
of course, you're going to realize that if we were going to have windmill farms across the entire nation, for example, there's no way that's ever going to be sustainable. Where are we going to keep all these parts 20 years from now when we have to recycle that entire fleet of windmills? It's, unsus it's absolutely unsustainable, uh, which is why nuclear power has to be the solution we look to at least for now and at least in conjunction with other renewables. And it has to be at the forefront because it's the only one that's been proven to be as efficient as we can possibly make it. It's the only one that's proven to be the most cost effective for the longest amount of time, for a consistent amount of time. And it's the only one that doesn't have some of these huge major problems that you're seeing with other renewables. Uh, something else that uh, our opponents bring up though, is that it's really about, they kind of throw this in at the, at the, last of, the end of their last speech. So they say, really we just need to consume less. And I think when we're talking about this point that we've kind of been going back and forth on about like poor countries and people's access to energy, it's really easy to say from the perspective of two nations that are already industrialized that have relied on fossil fuels for the last hundred years in order to develop, it's really easy for us to say we, just, we need to consume less. We are the ones that are consuming. We are the problem, yes. But it's so much easier to say that we should stop consuming because we've already benefited from fossil fuels. Developed, de uh, developing nations, nations in the global south, haven't had the same access to that kind of energy. And it is our job as nations that have that wealth as a result to help other countries implement clean energy in ways that matter, in ways that will work, in ways that are sustainable. It becomes our responsibility because we were the ones that benefited from it. Uh, so ultimately today, I think you're going to be wanting to side with the affirmation on this position. Because we need to do something about climate change. We could kill everybody, sure. <laughs> That's something we could do. Uh, we could rely on renewables that are mostly unproven, don't have very high capacity, aren't very cost efficient, and are ultimately gonna run us into the ground. Or we can go with nuclear energy, which yes, does produce waste that we can see and that's super spooky and scary. <laughs> but it works so much better. And it is the option that we have to look to for the future if we want any chance at getting rid of our reliance on fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Springsteen. <laughs> Mr. Member of the Opposition, will you make your speech, please? I've lost my mind. I've spent the night crying on the floor of my bathroom. But you're so unaffected, I really don't get it. But I guess, good for you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a world where 17-year-old Olivia Rodrigo can come out with lyrics like that is a world that isn't uh, deserving of such beauty. We are intrinsically <laughs> terrible beings, and we are a plague on this beautiful planet. That is why pro opposition win this debate. Thank you for listening. Okay. <laughs> Today, I've got five main areas of this debate that I need to cover. Uh, them being safety, people, efficiency, alternatives, and the applications. I'll deal with each, all five of those in my speech, and by the end of it, you should come to the conclusion that opposition clearly win this debate. Uh, so the first issue that I'm going to talk about is safety. That's been a very, very big concern throughout the entirety of this debate. Um, so I think the main thing that opposition have here, over proposition, is that there's no guarantee. And we've been told a lot of, this is physically impossible, it, it can't happen. And I realize that proposition have a lot of academia on their side, and we in opposition are yet to do that, so I'm gonna provide a little of my own. Now, I have done a bit of research uh, on the plane over, I watched the Simpsons movie. Now, when I was watching that, uh, it sort of showed me that with nuclear waste, we can get all these beautiful animals on Earth, but when they're exposed to waste, they sort of come out looking like my sister uh, in the morning, and they're just hideous beasts that should never uh, be seen. <laughs> now, I loved seeing the scenery and the animals here in America, and it'd be a shame for all of that to go away. But on a more serious note, we were told about the nuclear spillage in Minnesota, and Prof told us, ah, that's not a nuclear fallout, don't worry about it. How close and how much nuclear waste do you want in your rivers before you consider that a nuclear fallout? I know personally, I wouldn't want to go swimming there, and I wouldn't want my dog to be eating or drinking that water. And, and so, even coming on to the safety aspect of, well, 
nowadays this isn't gonna happen. Look, we might get a little spillage here and there, maybe our legs will be a little bit green, but sure, it's Paddy's day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now let's look at it from the perspective of all the past disasters. You had Fukushima quite recently. There was a very clear oversight, human error. That's not something that we can either, ever chemically or physically get rid of. Human error exists, no thank you. Um, we've, got three, we've got Three Mile Island. The commission date for Three Mile Island was December 30th, 1978. The decommission date was March 28th, 1979. That's three months. I've gone three months on Tinder without a match. That length of time is nothing. <laughs> this was a state-of-the-art facility, and it got decommissioned in three months. Human error is a thing. Accidents happen on the opposition side of the house. Maybe we angle the solar panels so they don't get the mo most sun. On the opposition side of the house, there is nuclear fallout because their lives are put in jeopardy. Okay, uh, number two, let's talk about efficiency. And um, so it was told to us a lot of percentages. I felt like I was back in math class. Um, <laughs> but let's look at these percentages, percentages in, a, in a realistic way. So we're told that there's a great yield for nuclear energy. As Gavin said, who can get these yields? Is it applicable to the poorest nations on earth? Is it applicable to absolutely everyone? It is not. And so when you look at what is the most important solution to climate change, it is reaching those third world countries, it is reaching those developing countries who are using uh, extreme amounts of fossil fuels, who have no other alternative. Uh, no, thank you, not right now. <laughs> okay, um, and to go on again um, about efficiency, and again, I know that Whitworth love to have their sources, so my source for this one is the elderly farmer from Nebraska who was on the plane over with me, who was afraid of flying, and so forced me to talk to him on the takeoff and landing, but we'll get over it. And now this kind man was a farmer, and he told me how in one generation, it went from his dad plowing fields with horses to his son now getting in a tractor and to the inch having an AI plow that field for him. That is the development in technology that we're talking about here. We went from horses to AI driving tractors in one generation. Now it can be said, yes, maybe solar panels aren't that uh, efficient at the moment. Yes, maybe uh, wind turbines could be better, and we've heard a lot of stats and stuff like that. But think about the progress we can get if we invest more into, into those fields. It will be applicable for the poorest countries on earth. It will be applicable for everybody. And so when you talk about efficiency, it's clear that opposition take that point too. Next, let's talk about people. Um, like, practically, just where do you want to live? Do you want to live right next to a nuclear power station? Look, I know this isn't like a very technical answer. Maybe they are quite safe, and the chances are low. But, like, I'm never going to move next to one, and people aren't. And so, you kind of like just killing a city that makes one. And so, like, practically, for people, that would work. Alternatives, let's talk about alternatives. Um, back in the 19, 1990s, Germany had 19 nuclear power stations. And back then, they had about 3% green energy. Today, they have three nuclear power stations, and they have 42% green energy. They are scaling back their nuclear um, production. This is seen all across Europe in Italy and Switzerland and many other countries. Why? Because they know that uh, other alternative um, uses of energy are safer, and they are better for the people in which they are trying to serve. Now, let's also talk about, so that's alternatives taken care of. We've seen the, some of the largest, wealthiest countries in the world have uh, taken this on board, and the technology that they're using can be used in other countries, and we can help other countries with that. So again, another win for size up. Now let's look at applications. Well, as I said about development going from the horse to the tractor, when you look at um, the sort of development that's done with green energy, with these turbines, with the solar panels, it's sort of akin to the pinnacle of motorsport in Formula One. The brakes that are in your car were once developed and used in Formula One. That's how technology gets passed down from the very top uh, to everyday application. And so when you look at nuclear uh, into, into green energy, if we, if we fund these projects and learn more, then these applications are on a wider scale and far more civilian usage, not just powering your house. Who's to know what could happen as a result? To sum up, the burden of proof for each side has kind of been iffy throughout the debate, what's safest, what's best. Ultimately, where do you want your tax dollars to go? Do you want it to go to something that could potentially uh, fund uh, thing, a nuclear power station that could just cause a little, little bit of green in your water? Mm -hmm. uh, like the, that's like the least bad thing that could happen. Or do you want something that can actually help people all across the world? So 
something that can actually help solve climate change as something that is actually a real solution to the problem. I've been Jedi Master Oliver McKenna. Thank you for listening. <laughs>